Welcome to this deeper dive into protein identification. In this video, I'll talk about computational analysis of bottom-up proteomics data, specifically how we identify peptides and proteins. If you're not already familiar with the topic of mass spectrometry-based proteomics, I strongly recommend that you watch my core concepts video on it before continuing with this one. I will nonetheless start with a quick recap before talking about how to create a search database, how to use it to match peptides to spectra, how to estimate the error rates of such searches, and finally, how to infer proteins. Starting with the experimental recap. We start with a mixture of proteins, which we do protease digestion on to turn into a mixture of peptides. These are separated by liquid chromatography before running tandem mass spectrometry. What we do here is to ionize the peptides, separate them by their mass to charge ratios, fragment the ions, and finally measure the mass to charge ratios of the fragments. That gives us so-called fragment spectra. To identify what these spectra are, we need a search database. The starting point for this is a set of protein sequences, typically coming from Uniprot knowledge base, but they could also be inferred from a sample transcript in case you've done transcriptomics on the same samples. We take these sequences and perform in silico digestion to obtain triptych peptides and sometimes also semi-triptych and peptides with missed cleavages. For each peptide, we perform PTM expansion, that is, we create variants of the peptides with, for example, phosphorylation sites and other PTMs, and then fragment ion prediction on these to look at how the charge and mass can be distributed into a variety of different so-called Y ions and B ions. This gives us theoretical spectra. The problem is that this can easily result in a combinatorial explosion due to many different splice variants of proteins and a variety of different post-translational modifications that can occur on them. The result is a gigantic search database, which is bad news for two reasons. It slows down the analysis, since searching against more theoretical spectra takes more time, and it leads to worse significance, since searching against more candidates gives you more options to produce false positives. So how does the spectrum matching work? The idea is that you do a database search in which you match observed spectra against the theoretical spectra that we've just created a database of. This results in so-called PSMs, peptide spectrum matches. The first step is to apply a peptide mass filter. That is, you filter on the precursor mass tolerance on the instrument to only look at the relevant fragment spectra. How narrow a filter you can use depends on the type of instrument you have. If you're using an orbit trap, for example, you can go all the way down and use 10 ppm, which is good since it reduces your search space. This gives us a set of candidate peptides that we can score in a statistical fashion by looking at the overlaps of peaks between the experimental spectrum and the candidate spectrum. There's a number of different scoring schemes for this. Some popular ones are the max quant pep score and the sequest x core score. The problem with either score is that you need a cutoff. How good a score is good enough? This leads us to the clever trick of target decoy search. Imagine you take the search database and reverse all the sequences and chop them up to produce decoy peptides. These peptides should not exist in your actual sample. If you look at the score distributions of both the real target peptides and the decoy peptides, you will see that the target peptides can have very high scores, whereas the decoy peptides never score very high. Since we know that any decoy hit is false and that there's only one decoy per target, this gives us a direct estimate of the false target hits. We can simply choose a score cutoff, count the number of decoy hits, count the target hits, and put them into this formula to get an estimate of what the FDR would be if we use that score cutoff. And with that, we can of course work backwards and say which score cutoff should we use to obtain the desired false discovery rate. The bad news is that this FDR estimate is FDR of PSMs, not peptides and not proteins. The reason why that is the case is that true PSMs tend to group on relatively few true peptides, whereas false PSMs spread all over the place, hitting many false peptides and the situation is even worse for proteins. And that gets me to the final topic today, protein inference. A big problem in proteomics is what is called equivalent proteins. That is, that you can have multiple proteins that are supported by the same set of peptides, meaning that you cannot know which protein is actually in your sample. 
Another problem related to that is what is called subset proteins, where you may have a protein like protein 2, which is supported by some peptides. However, these can also be explained by another protein, protein 1. In other words, you have no evidence suggesting that protein 2 is actually there. The fundamental problem underlying this is non-unique peptides that can arise from multiple different proteins. This can either be because of the peptides being short and simply by random chance having the same sequence, but more often it's because of either close parallels or conserved domains that lead to many different shared peptides because of them being similar in sequence. The way we deal with that in proteomics is that we create protein groups that contain the indistinguishable proteins. These proteins can have varying levels of evidence. You have the leading proteins, which are the ones supported by most peptides. You have the majority proteins, which are supported by at least half as many as the leading proteins. And finally, you have all proteins, typically the ones with at least two peptides, because if a protein is supported by only one peptide, you probably shouldn't trust it. However, while protein groups kind of solve the problem, it can be a big issue for downstream analysis. How do you perform enrichment analysis when you don't know which proteins are in your samples? How do you create a network visualization when you don't know which proteins you should look up protein interactions for? That's all I have to say about the topic of protein identification. If you want to learn more about how to analyze proteomics data, I suggest you watch this video next. Thanks for your attention.